Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Casey. I'm an alcoholic. Yay. And it's through a loving God, strong sponsorship, the 12 steps and traditions as outlined in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, working with others that I haven't found the necessary to take a drink or a drug since August 17th, 1996, and for that I'm not truly grateful enough. So I'd like to thank Chris for having me come up here, and uh, it's always an honor to come speak on, uh, speak in general, to speak on a topic, because, oops, sorry, um, like for me, I have to go back into my textbook, which is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I start looking, you know, I start reading, working with others, and a vision for you, and with the topic in mind, creating the fellowship I crave. And then I talk to people who I use in my sponsorship line, or not my sponsorship line, but how I use for guidance. You know, I have my sponsor, I have other women, some men in the program who I like their sobriety, they're like-minded individuals like myself who believe in the 12 steps and the power of God, and I ask them, like, what did that mean to them? And then I take those concepts, I pray on them, I meditate, I read this big book again with those thoughts in mind, because, like, what the set-aside prayer says to me is that, because I want to have a new experience with these things in the book. Like, I want to have a new experience with everything in this book. And, uh, you know, like, I constantly have to seek a spiritual experience. So, like, I always think, I'm thankful for topics like this. So it helps me to, you know, develop myself. So, and, uh, you know, things take on new meaning for me constantly. But let me just tell you a little bit about what it was like for me, because I just want to qualify that I am an alcoholic, and I want you to be able to at least to identify to me if you are new. Um, I grew up in Queens, New York. I had, like, a typical family. You know, all my needs were provided for. My mother happens to be an alcoholic, and she has 19 years of recovery. Um, And uh, at eight years old, some uh, catastrophic life events happened for me where my parents got divorced, my mom moved us to Whitehall, New York from Queens, and my world was shattered. I kind of didn't know what happened to me. Like, I, I was so lost, and I was shy. I was a shy, scrawny kid, and I cried, and I hated it. I felt very weak, and I had no control, and I hated it. Um, before I found alcohol, I found crazy. <laughs> I would say that because I was watching Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapon where he says, pain doesn't hurt unless you want it to. And I was like, okay, Mel, pain doesn't hurt unless you want it to. And I owned that expression. And, you know, I was still going to Queens and hanging out with um, Whitehall, New York. And I had this, like, Dr. Jack Bill and Mr. Hyde. I was, like, good with my mom. You know, got straight A's in school, took care of my brother while my mom is in her act of alcoholism, was forging checks just to keep the heat on, doing everything I can. And then when I was with my father, I was this, like, crazy individual who took on people. Like, if they're looking at me wrong, I'm going to beat you up. Like, do you have a problem? I said a lot of obscenities that I'm trying to refrain from. So as I'm being recorded, I don't want people to know I say those words, but I do. So, and I would, like, you know, and I would... Or I, and I remember, like, seeking attention. Like, I would dress up like a Christmas tree and say, I'm a Christmas tree, make a wish on me. And I would think I'm not looking for attention. I don't want attention. <laughs> like, I just did not see that. And uh, I say this because I learned when I got to AA that, uh, you know, that my drinking didn't cause my character defects. My character defects caused my drinking. You know, I don't know whether or not I was born an alcoholic or not, but I don't care. I just am one. You know, it's just how it came out to be. And when... In the midst of my life, in life, you know, living this way of trying to, I became physically numb. You could put a cigarette out on me and I wouldn't feel it. I didn't even flinch, you know, and I didn't even care. Like, I don't care. I was like this little kid. You know, you hate those kids who say that. I don't care. I don't care. Whatever. That was me. And um, I got in everybody's nerves. And I thought I knew everything and I knew nothing. You know, I don't have to, you know, I, I thought I knew everything. And in the midst of this, I found alcohol. And I felt that, ugh feeling like everything's going to be okay, you know, and then it started out just drinking on the weekends, and then it started to increase, you know, and what I found, you know, instantaneous for me, like, alcohol became like a necessity. I had to have it all the time. Within making a decision to start drinking and drugging, I got kicked, I got kicked out of a normal high school, and I got sent to an emotionally disturbed school, which I thought was a very cool thing. I'm emotionally disturbed, just so you know, I told everybody, I'm emotionally disturbed. I was so happy. 
<laughs> you know, like people thought I had like issues. They thought like, she, you know, Cass, you know, that's my mom. I think your daughter is like crazy. They're like, really? Ooh. You know, and then, within a, you know, by my junior year in high school, I can tell you that I was drinking or drugging almost every day to get out of my skin. I felt like a whore. I wanted to die, and I just didn't have the nerve to do it. I didn't understand what was going on with me. All I knew was I had the balls to do anything. You know, I really did. I would jump off the bridge. I would, you know, start a fight. I had no problem, but I could just not end my own life. You know, I just cannot do it. And I was just at that jumping off part of the book where it talks about. And uh, I just was, you know, lost everything by like, and I'm like, about to fall over. (laughs) Some things haven't changed. And so I was at that jumping off part. And for me, like, not even turning 17, I got kicked out of my emotionally disturbed high school, which the only thing they asked you to do was to sit for five hours, because they knew you couldn't do any more than that, okay? They allowed you to smoke in this emotionally disturbed high school because they know how stressful your life is. And the bus comes to your house to pick you up because they know you're not going to walk, okay, outside your house to go to school. I couldn't do it. I mean, that's how much drinking and drugging became a part of my life. Like, I know I'm an alcoholic and I say drugs, but I did have a combination of both bits what made me hit bottom. But I know that in my heart I am an alcoholic. Um, I got kicked out of my house. And uh, I had nowhere to go, you know. I wasn't, I'm not one of those people that I was able to get a job, graduate high school, you know. Like, I wasn't that type of functioning alcoholic. I lost everything. And uh, we were faced with going to Devereaux or living with my sponsor. I was like, I'll live with my sponsor. Okay, you know, I thought that was the easier, softer way. I was wrong. I was wrong. (laughs) She's hard, you know. She wouldn't let me nap. I was like, I need to nap. She's like, you need to babysit. She's like, you are so full of self, you know. And But I came to this program with, I just didn't want to die. And I did everything that my sponsor asked me to do. I was just as willing as a dying can be. You know, I didn't question her. I just did. I did not want my old life. And she told me that if I work these steps, right, and that I don't worry about the past because we're going to work on it together, and I don't worry about the future because it's not here today, and I work on today, that by going through these steps, I'll have the option to recreate my life, you know, and it'll be one that I've never been, you could, I could recreate it to whatever I want it to be, you know, and that I'll be able to have a life again, and I'll be able to have a sober life, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, and I had some crazy dreams, just so you know, my dream was like, I want to be a stunt woman, that was my dream, she's like, okay, but let's do step one, you know, I was like, okay, you know, so I went through the plan as outlined in this book, and that's the first 164 pages, Okay, I took, you know, I found the power of God, you know, I found God instantly, you know, and then my relationship with God has developed over the years. I did a moral inventory. I can, you know, said that to my sponsor. I have, you know, I got uh, a list of what my defects of character are. I asked God to remove some of them. Some of them I asked to hold on to because I really like them. And then I became willing at later dates to remove him, you know, and I just never said no. And I always said, God, I'm not willing yet to give this to you. But I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be willing. And that's what I've learned. Like, all I have to do is be willing to be willing. And more will be revealed. And as I go through the process, more has been revealed. I've made amends. I actively work 10, 11, 12 in my daily life. I have a sponsor. Uh, I am available for sponsorship. And I do sponsor. So, creating the fellowship you crave. Um, in Chapter 7, Working with Others, It says on the second paragraph, life will take on new meaning to watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We will know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. And, uh, you know, it also talks about that, and there is a solution. It mentions our fellowship again, but the fellowship is different than the program. You know, the program is the 12 steps. The fellowship is the people and the meetings that we come to meet. And what I've learned in creating the fellowship I crave is really that fellowship is by the service that I do. Like, I've created a fellowship through service, not through, like, who's going to go with me to the club or who's going to do this with me or who wants to go here? It's not about what, how I want my friends to be. It's really about, like, I had to learn to think of others. And I learned that through, you know, the others, like, in Chapter 3. You know, it says in, the, in our third step, you know, we offer ourselves to God and, uh, and to remove from us our difficulties. And what the third step in short has learned to be for me is that um, I'm no longer a taker, I'm a giver. 
you know. So I start learning how to see what I can give to these people's lives. You know, and in the beginning, giving was I set up the tables and chairs. I made coffee. I picked up cigarette butts and ashtrays. You know, and by coming early, I met people at my home group. I had a home group. I suggest everyone to have a home group because it's a place where people get to know you and where they get to, you get to develop friendships and start, and and it's a pretty amazing thing. And I got to watch people in my home group solve problems in their life without having to drink. And that gave me hope. And they got a chance to see, like, this really screwed up kid who was just trying. You know, and they and they lay aside their prejudice with me, and I had the ability to lay aside my prejudice with them, and we got to meet on that common ground in AA. You know, where we just we're coming, we don't talk, we don't compare our drinking stories, we look at our feelings, and I started to see that I could relate to these women, these men, despite that they're 50 or 20 or whatever age they were. You know, and uh, for me, I had to always look at in my life when I'm saying all this stuff to people, like I'm praying to God and I'm doing everything in my life, like. Do my words match my actions? And I always tell my sponsees, like, I'm never going to ask you to do anything I haven't done myself. But I've learned in our traditions that it's attraction rather than promotion. So if I'm looking for this fellowship, then I have to make sure that I'm, a tr- I'm that attractive person. Like, why would people want to come up to me? You know what I mean? Why would people want to get to know me? And the w- things that I've learned to do that are by practicing these principles in all my affairs, which Anne-Marie talked about last week. And I wasn't here from it, but uh, our sponsorship lines kind of crisscross, so I know that there are some, like, some of the same things. And some of the principles that we learn on here, um, you can take one from page 19 or 20 of the big book. I'm a big book thumper. You know, I don't know if you noticed. But I don't want you to think these are like my ideas, you know. These are like the black parts of the book. So it said most of us sense our real talents of other people's shortcomings and viewpoints and a respect for their opinions and attitudes, which make us more useful to others. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we might help meet their needs. I hate that line. You know what I mean? Because it gives it to you on page 19. It's like, you know, you're just like barely sober, and I already have to start thinking of others. But it tells us right from the get-go we have to think of others because we are so consumed with ourselves. And for me, in creating the fellowship that I crave, it's not about me. You know what I mean? It's not about what I want. It's about really by opening myself up, being of maximum service to God. And by doing that, I find like-minded individuals like myself who, like, are alive about this program, who are so happy to have their lives, you know, be recreated recreated for them and sober and I align myself with people like that and what I start doing is I start walking into situations and I see people and I'm judging them and I'm like great page 19 and 20 I'm supposed to have tolerance of other people and I a respect for their viewpoints and you know what I don't have to do that but if I want people to respect my opinions and what I have to say then I have to be willing to bring that so that becomes like a principle for me like how learning to have real tolerance for others it all talks about that in our 11th and our ninth step love and tolerance of others um, you know it says on page 44 like am I living on a spiritual basis you know what does that mean for me like how am I inviting God into my life um, and my priorities for me are always um, God AA and then Casey's responsibilities so, and then it says for me in uh, We Agnostics, like, do I believe God is everything? And that's such a hard question sometimes. When life is good, do I believe God is everything? Absolutely. When life is hard, you know what I mean? I could tell you in the beginning, it was like, yes, God is everything. But the longer I stay sober, sometimes I kind of think that I can do it. It's like, it's okay, God, I got this one. You know what I mean? I got some information now and some self-knowledge, and I'm good. And then I get, like, a little spank. You know, I'm like, okay, yeah, I got some pain, and I'm, like, willing to, like, you know, surrender again to God. And I get to grow. Um, I say all these things because, like, I have to let go of old ideas, and I have to set aside my prejudices so I can really be of maximum service. And I, I can't say that enough. And I can tell you, when I started to do those things, what happened was, when I first got sober, I got sober at a, well, this time, last time I got sober, I got sober at St. Clair's Adolescent Rehab. And I happened to, I had a friend who, was, who did a 12-step call on me when I was still, like, in and out. He was in the hospital. And... I went to go visit him. I had like three months sober, and uh, you know he his liver was failing and he was dying. And I was going to say, you know, just you know, give him some love, you know, just thank him. Like he really was there for me in some of the hard parts of my life. And um, I ran into this old counselor of mine in the elevator, and she's like, Oh my God! She's like, Are you still sober? And I'm like, Yeah. Like, couldn't you tell? She's like, No. 
right? Because I'm crazy. Because when I first got sober, I was still crazy, and I still dressed really wild. Like, I was wearing, like, polyester, like, it was a 96. It wasn't in. You know what I mean? It was like, I still remember, like, baby blue, blue pants with stitched out knees, like, platform shoes and, like, the swirly shirts. Yeah. And my God, my conception of the guy at the time was dinky. You know, I did a lot of acid. You know, and I was less like, you know, but that was where I started. And it has grown since then. So this woman's asking me, like, are you still sober? I'm like, yeah. She's like, we really need some people to come into. The, your rehab to speak. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll come every Saturday. She's like, well, we need every other Saturday. And I was like, okay. And what I did was I started bringing this meeting to this, my old, re, my last rehab I was in, in St. Clair's. And I brought different people every week who are young people in sobriety. You know, and what happened was it forced me to go find people out there who were young in sobriety because I wanted to show these kids that there's a lot of young people getting sober, you know, and to give them some hope because that's what inspired me to get sober. I got some hope because I was open-minded at one point to hear this woman, Roseanne, carry a message to me, and I was like, okay. And so I wanted to do the same things for these same people. And uh, so I found, like, all these young people who are working this program, and every other Saturday we brought them this meeting. You know, and guess what happened? I started becoming friends with these people because, you know what, we were both on this journey of inviting God into our lives and helping others, and we were, like, on fire, and everyone wanted to be around us, you know? And it wasn't, like, at any ego or anything, but it's just, like, we had that energy, like, you just want to be there to see what's going to happen. And it was really amazing, and we saw some kids get sober, you know, that we were like, oh, I don't know if I could get sober with those problems, you know, and we did, and we saw these kids get sober, and it was amazing. And I had the opportunity to uh, bring that meeting there until the, the rehab closed, and I did that for three years, you know. Um, I'm always doing some type of service in one form or another. So uh, some of the principles that I've had to learn in order to create that fellowship that I crave is... Um, on page 77, it says, like, do I criticize people or argue? You know, it mentions that in our amends, like when we're making amends to somebody, we don't criticize them or argue them. But I can have to take that into other relationships, like sometimes, like, outside of A, like my work relationships. Like, do I gossip about these people? Do I criticize them? You know, I have to look at those things. You know, if I'm seeking to create um, a fellowship or want people to be attracted to the person I am, then I can't be living in those ways. You know, and for me as a sponsor and being available for sponsorship, I don't partake in gossip. It's very hard. I feel very left out sometimes as I hear people chatting all this good stuff and I want to know. But what I know is that, like, yeah, I'm going to be honest. Like, I just want to, like, listen. Like, oh, maybe my sponsee will call me later and tell me, you know, as I drive away pouting. I'm joking. But, um, no, I'm not. So, uh, <laughs> so what happened is I had trust issues when I got sober. And for me, I wanted to know what I told my sponsor was staying with her. You know what I mean? And I wanted to know if we were in a group of people that you weren't going to slip up or something wasn't going to happen. And I, like for me, it's like I just cannot tell you my deepest, darkest secrets. Like I cannot share my fix up with you if I thought you gossiped. Like I just would crumble. You know, and for me, I feel like if I want to say I'm going to be a sponsor, be available for sponsorship, then I have to show that in my life. And I, and I don't partake in gossip. I kind of just walk away. I make some boundaries. Like, I'm not okay with that. You know what I mean? Or I just step away. You know, it's, it's like to each his own. And for me, like, I feel like that's more important. And uh, sometimes I struggle for that, you know. But it's like I am human. And it's one of those things that I feel that has proven to be beneficial. And I know that the women I sponsor are always clear that they know that they can trust me. Because regardless of anything, it's, it's my job is to help someone find God, to clean house and find God. That's my main purpose. You know, and I have to always remember that everything else is just a bonus. You know, being sober is like the greatest gift I have because I have a chance to do anything. If I'm not sober, I have nothing. If I'm a real alcoholic, which I know I am. So um, on page 79, it talks about, am I willing to go to any lanes to find a spiritual experience, which I talked about. And I feel like I am. You know, I'll, I'll do... You know, sometimes I, I kind of balk when my sponsor now says, okay, it's time to do a fourth step. I'm like, oh... Do you think I really need it? She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. And um, But, like, it's my job. to. I want to keep growing closer to God. And the more I do that, the more I find kind of what's blocking me from really having, like, a, a happy and stable life. You know, and it also mentions that we agnostics. It talks about, page 89, am I helpful? 
And uh, that's the biggest way that I've created a fellowship for myself. Because when I got sober, I would go, I uh, made amends to my family, and I kind of felt like this black sheep in the family. Like, I just didn't know what to do with myself now. Like, I go there because I wasn't living at home anymore, and I just stand there, and I was kind of like, I don't have a room in this house anymore. I don't know what you do in this house anymore. I don't really know what I'm supposed to do in this house anymore because last time I was here, I just called you the C word every other t- sentence I could, and I'm not supposed to do that anymore. And my sponsor was like, contribute. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like, what's that? <laughs> and I had, you know, and I see what I could do for my mom. You know, like, if there was dishes in the sink, I did the dishes. If she needed me to run an errand for her, I'm like, do you need anything at the store? Can I get something for you? You know, and I just see how I could be a help. And it especially worked at family events, like trying to get reacquainted with my family. Like I made amends to my family, and they wanted me to, my part of my amends was they wanted to see me. And it was really uncomfortable. Some of my family still drank. So what I had to do was, if I was spiritually fit, I went. I'm going to talk about that. It goes on to say about those things in a... Page 100, working with others. But what I started to learn to do was contribute. So when I would go to these places, I would just try to help the people who are hosting the party. Is there anything I could do to take out for you? You know, I try to get, you know, I get my grandmother, like, do you want another seltzer? You know, like I make her a plate. And I had a great time. And the funniest thing happened, everyone thought I was so great. You know, they're like, Joe, your daughter's so great. And I had, you know, because they had no idea who I was. Because, you know, the other couple times I was there, I was leaving those parties, hiding around the corner, you know, just drinking. You know, so they never had a conception of who I was. And what started happening was I got reacquainted with my family. You know, and I started like they started to wanting to have me around and I started wanting to be around and I started learning how to be one among many. In a working with others, it says on the bottom of page 100, assuming we are spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. People have said we must not go where liquor is served. We must not drink. It, we must not have it in our homes. We must not shun friends who drink. We must avoid movie, movie pictures which show drinking scenes. We must not go to, into bars or friends. must hide their bottles. We go to their houses. We mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol. Our experience shows that this is not necessary. so. We meet these conditions every day. An alcoholic who cannot meet these still has an alcoholic mind. There is something the matter with his spiritual status. His only chance for sobriety would be a place like the Greenland Ice Cap. And even there, an Eskimo might turn up with a bottle of scotch and run <laughs> and ruin everything. Ask any woman who has set her husband to distant places on the theory that he would escape the alcoholic problem. So our rule is, is not to avoid a place where there is alcohol if, big if, we have a legitimate reason for being there. This in, that includes bars, nightclubs, dances, receptions, weddings, even plain, ordinary whoopee parties. To a person who has experience with an alcoholic, this may seem like tempting prowess, but it isn't. You will note that we made an important qualification. Therefore, ask yourself on each occasion, have I good any social, business, or personal reason for going to this place? Or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere of such places? If you answer these questions satisfactorily, you need have no apprehension. Go or stay for whichever seems best, but be sure you are on solid spiritual ground before you start and that you have, your motive for going is thoroughly good. And uh, I love that. And it's really funny because that's on page 100, 101. It's not on page 19. And I always point that out because you've gone through, you know, you've done a fourth step, you've done a fifth, you've established a relationship with God. And uh, for me, I had to check my motives out every single time I went out. You know, I wanted to, you know, I got sober. I was 17 years old. I got sober at 18. I graduated high school. I wanted to start having a life. I love to dance. I love to dance. And I wanted to go out dancing. And my sponsor would be like, well, do you have a good reason? I'm like, yeah, to dance. (laughs) Duh. You know? And she was like, "Um, well, you have to do your motives for why you're going to this club. You know? And I was like, and then my sponsorship line, not mine, but the sponsorship line I'm in, we do page 69, and I had to check my motive for going, and it's the sexual inventory. But what you, I have to do is I have to answer those questions in absolute statements, saying, like, I go to this club. You know, I went to this club, and then I answer those questions, like, where was I selfish, self-centered, self-seeking? And I try to ascertain, like, what might be some problems or what defects might I be interfering with this? And then I do it the opposite. I don't go to this club. And then I find out what, you know, and it gives me, I find out kind of what might be a problem. And for me, it helps me put a, 
a rough idea about, like, am I trying to seek vicarious pleasure? And I can tell you I had to give up going to some clubs sometimes because, you know what, I just wanted to go there to be the hot chick, you know what I mean, and dance on a pole, you know? That's not the best reasons for going to a club, you know? And that sucked. It really did. And, um, you know... And so I, and I, I didn't go, and I pouted. And I felt like such a baby. I remember calling these girls in sobriety. I can't go. I'm not spiritually fit, you know? And, like, feeling so stupid, you know? And they're like, and they're, like, in sobriety. They're like, well, we'll, we'll check you. And I'm like, yeah. But you met my sponsor, and I just don't want to tell her. Like, I lied. And she's like, and they're like, okay. They're like, bye. Like, click. I was like, <laughs> I stayed home, you know? And you know what? It sucked that night, I have to say. It wasn't like, oh, yay, I stayed home and watched movies, you know? But it was one of those things that I don't, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in those situations, especially where alcohol is involved. I don't, I can't predict what's going to happen. It's not a controlled environment, you know? So I, I stayed home. And you know what? I can tell you that years later, like at five, six, seven years, I, you know, I can tell instantly if I'm spiritually fit. And if I want to go out dancing, I can go out dancing. You know, I have a, one or two girlfriends that I call. I say, would you like to go out? We go out together. You know, we have a great time and we leave and there's never a problem. You know, I can tell you when I first got sober, there was always another motive for me going to do something, you know, and I had to look at what that motive was. You know, because I will definitely hurt other people or myself. You know what? And I decided at one point that, you know what? I want to stop hurting Casey because I'm always willing to hurt Casey. I'm always willing to put up with more, like put up with more crap, like let her get into more consequences, suffer the consequences just for that I want. You know what? And I wanted to really stop doing that and really just trying to see like what God had in store for me. You know, so with that being said, I also said that I wanted to be a stunt woman. You know what I mean? Let me tell you, I thought that was like the greatest job in the world. I had no idea how hard that job was, you know, and I had the opportunity to do that. I wanted to say because it does apply in a sense. So like I would go on these movies and work like 20 hours. You know what I mean? Like they just does, it doesn't say that. Like just so you know, like you'll have to work 20 hours <laughs> anywhere. You know, and I would go and I was able to see spiritually fit. And I remember on my first stunt job, I uh, you know I met with my sponsor. I prayed. You know what I mean? I checked what, you know, like I knew what I was supposed to do. And I went on this job, right? And there was this young girl there who was 19 years old, and I was like 26. And uh, I hated her. I was like, she took my dream. I don't even know her. She's taken my dream, right? And everyone thought she was so great. And I remember just, uh, like, so jealous. And it was the first time I was ever jealous, like really jealous of, like, a female. I was like, I wanted to be her. And I hated that she was having this opportunity that I didn't have. I went up into my hotel room. I was, like, praying. I'm calling my sponsor. No one's answering because I'm like, God, of course, when I need someone, no one's answering. And so, like, I open my big book. I pray, you know. I ask God to enter my heart. Like, please take away my, these thoughts. Like, you're giving me the, uh, my opportunity of a lifetime, and please help me just to enjoy this experience as it is. And something happened. I had to go back down to the chute. I went there, and it was removed. You know what I mean? I helped this girl to perfect her stunt. She got more credit, and I was so happy for her. I had a girl who I had to ride on a motorcycle. I had to put a bomb on a car. It was really a cool stunt on my motorcycle. I had, like, a really cool outfit. Right? And I was able to stop thinking about myself to see how this girl was so scared. Right? I said, you should have told me you were scared. We would have practiced. You know, I'm like, she's like, but what about, I'm like, I control the bike. You hold on, okay? I will not let you fall off this bike. Do not worry. You know? I said, she's like, I just can't reach that far. And I was like, fine, I'll put the bike right next to the car. And I did. And I've never done this before, but I'm like, I can do it. I know I can do it. I feel like the power of God. Really scary, right? Like, feel the power of God. I'll put my bike right next to a car. So... And <laughs> in a controlled environment. And I did this. And I can tell you, she was able to be safe. You know, the stunt came out great. Everyone liked the work that I did. And I got another job from it. And by the end of the movie shoot, everyone was like, I want to ride a motorcycle. And it was like, they're like, I want to be you, Casey. You ride this motorcycle. And I was like, what an awesome feeling. It was such an awesome feeling. And I journaled that because it was such a great feeling how I stepped out of the way. You know, I asked God to please remove me of my selfishness. 
you know, and to be uh, not a taker and a giver and just to consider others. And what happened was, and this is outside of AA, but it's like it is creating this fellowship. It doesn't say creating a fellowship just in AA, but it's like creating this. It's like unlimited. Like God is unlimited and so it is power. He works for us inside and outside of these rooms. And outside of these rooms, like I had that moment just to, you know, be a good person. And what happened was these people would always want to work with me because they felt that I kept them safe. You know what I mean? I'm like, my job is to keep you safe. And that was my job. And I was only able to do that with God. And it just showed me still, and I had like 10 years sober, you know, that, you know, or nine, I'm really bad at math, 17, 25, nine, or eight, eight, bad. I'm going to be a school teacher, I can't add, right? I recreated my life again. I'm going to be a school teacher because that was too hard. But um, so anyway, and uh, it just was pretty amazing how it happened. And I just stepped out of the way. And uh, it just shows me constantly how uh, I just have to remove myself from the problem, you know, the situation, and things just work out the way it's supposed to. And I get to have, uh, I get to have some really, I have some really neat friends now. <laughs> so, in a vision for you, I'm just going to read a couple things. I still have some time. Um, it says on page one, 156. Um, you know, it says, but life was not easy for the two friends. Plenty of difficulties presented themselves. Both saw that they, need, they must keep spiritually active. One day they called up the head nurse of a local hospital. They explained their need and inquired if she had a first-class alcoholic prospect. So this is like Dr. Bill and, uh, I'm sorry, Bob and, um, Dr. Bob and Bill, and they're uh, trying to create this fellowship they crave. You know what I mean? And they are trying to seek out prospects, and so they call up this head nurse you know, at this hospital to, to find out qualc number three. And this is how they're creating up, creating their fellowship. And all throughout this book, they talk about creating this fellowship, and this fellowship is all created out of service. And uh, for me, like I told you, I had that rehab commitment. I had a, a juvenile detention commitment where I spoke at a juvenile detention, you know, and I brought speakers in. And I try just to, you know, bring the message of what I've learned and carry that. Um, when I'm asked to speak at com- meetings like this, you know, I try to carry this message. And it's like I'm always just trying to find hopeless alcoholics and provide them with the solution that I had. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing because, you know, just before the meeting I was talking about it. You know, I have like 13 years sobriety. You know, and, you know, like I go to meetings sometimes and it's like I want to hear people talking about how they're applying it in their life after they've gone through it once or twice. Like, what are they doing now to keep seeking that spiritual experience? And uh, so what I do is like I kind of try to talk about what it was like for me and what I'm doing now, because I also want to find individuals who are doing the same thing. Like, how are they, you know, doing this again to have another spiritual experience? And it's one way of like me just trying to like seek this fellowship that I have. You know, I joined a new home group. I moved to Union. I joined a new home group that is based in, you know, there are big book thumpers. There's people in this meeting with more time than I do, which I love. Keeps me humble. You know, like I just don't not want to be the person with the most amount of sobriety in the room. And uh, I get to go, and it's a speaker's meeting, and I get just to listen. And I find other vids- individuals who are like-minded like myself. And what I find for me is that some point in sobriety, I uh, had friends who decided that they were going to half measure it. And I had friends who decided they were going to do it. And I wanted to have the best, of, the best of both worlds. And I was the type of person who, I didn't change the toilet paper in the morning for my sponsor after the roll ran out. I had a bad day. And all day I got so mad. Because there's not like I could go back home and change the toilet paper. I'm just the jerk who didn't change the toilet paper. And it rang with me all day long. I'm the jerk who did not change the toilet paper. You know, and my sponsor would tell me, you didn't change the toilet paper. I'm like, I know. Like six hours in my head. That's all I've heard. That's all I've heard. And I can't call you. It's not cell phone. And I was like, ah. And I'm like, I thought about it. She's like, great. That didn't help me when I sat down, right? And I was like, that sucks, right? So, and uh, so I had to stop being like this mindless individual, just go into situations and just be all about me. And it's like I've learned through the help of like Barefoot Bill, I'm really practicing step 11, like how to be in this moment, not being where I'm going to be after this meeting, but being right here where my feet are. And by just trying to keep it to one minute at a time, I've had to see like what I just be so mindful. It's like, you know, like cleaning the sink, you know, not leaving dishes for my boyfriend who I live with, you know, making sure there's toilet paper there. But uh, when I first got sober, I had friends who decided that, and, uh, you know, 
There are musts in here if you're a real alcoholic, but everyone has the right to choose their own path of how they find God. You know, who am I to judge them? And I have friends who decided that they just didn't want to do all this stuff in here, and I wanted to do it all. And it became very difficult for me because um, I would, you know, I'm trying to apply these principles on all my life, and I have friends who are not applying these principles on all their life, and they're being dishonest, and they're... Um, at, they're acting out, you know, sexually and having one night stands and just being careless. And I couldn't do that. Like for me, I couldn't do that. You know, like I've learned for me in, uh, in doing my sexual ideal, like if I'm going to engage with someone, they have to be with my sexual ideal. Doesn't mean one night stands are bad, just for me. Just saying it for me. And uh, it was one of the things like I used to hate them. Like I just want one, you know, but like I really... It would cause too much harm for me because for me, I just never wanted to feel like a whore again. And I just never wanted to use somebody, you know, and I just, I'm so mental. Like, I have abandonment issues. I'll never leave. I'll just be sitting there looking at you like, hey, creepy girl. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be creepy either. So I was like, uh, okay. So, and, uh, so I'm sitting here and I'm having such a, (laughs) great honesty, great. So, um, it's recorded. I keep forgetting that. So, um, and I'm sitting there and I, I would find myself in these uncomfortable situations, like not being okay in the environment that I'm in, but I want these, I want these friends and I want to be cool because they're cool. And I don't want to ha- keep hanging out with 40 year old men and women who take me to sober dances. You know, when you're 19, there's just something about that. that's just kind of like, yeah, <laughs> have a nice ride case, you know, like I, you know, and they were a great, they were great, great people. And, uh, I had to make that decision, though, it was like this internal suffering that I had. And uh, for me, it just became so difficult, you know, um, because it's like, you know, it's like I was accepting to, I was accepting a world that wasn't acceptable for me, is what it came down for. It's okay for them. We all have our path. Like, I've acted out in sobriety and not the most spiritual ways, where, like, especially driving, I'm bad. Like, I will cut you off. I will torture you. Like, that's your exit. I'll go five miles an hour. Hi! And I'll smile. Hi! You know, we all have our areas. And uh, so, but I was accepting this unacceptable behavior, and it was bringing in all these kind of like other people into my life who I wasn't like. It was attracting people who I wouldn't normally want to mix with. And I just had to accept that, you know what? I just can't do it. You know, I have to apply these principles all my life, and that that life isn't for me. And I want to be with people who are seeking the same path as I am. And I I had to say goodbye. And they weren't, you know, and and they're friends of mine. They're still sober, and they're happy, you know, but it's like to their definition, not to mine. I have a different definition about what it means to be happy, joyous, and free. And I find that when I invite God into my life and really align myself to his vision for me, I am truly happy. And And I love it, and I have no regrets. When I do it the other way, I have regrets. I'm happy only in the moment. It's like fleeting and then soon lost. And then I feel like I'm a bad girl. And what did I do wrong? And I hate that whole idea in my head. So I set this boundary, you know, and I had learned how to do that with my fourth step and setting, you know, an ideal, you know, ideal me. I started setting, like, I want someone who's honest and faithful, so I had to be honest and faithful. But, I mean, I had to have other people in my life who were honest and faithful. I don't really want friends who are going to lie to me. I don't want to have a sponsor, you know, have a sponsor who's just going to, you know, coax, you know, not tell me the truth. I want people to call me on my crap. If you see me standing in crap, tell me I'm standing in crap. Like, don't wait until, like, two months later, like, oh, yeah, I saw that. I'm like, thanks. And let me sit there. Like, that just sucks, you know? And so I made that decision. And when I made that decision, the most amazing thing happened was that those old friends I was holding on to, I was given a whole new set of friends almost instantaneously. Like, it's like by letting go of them, God gave me a whole group, new group of people to hang out with. And it was, and we had a great time, you know? Um, I'm a, I invite my sponsees into my life when I sponsor them. I, can't, I show them my life just the way it is. I don't dress it up. You know, <laughs> and my house has been a disgrace sometimes when I've let them in. Or, and they're like, I'm like, yeah, I've been working. Okay, so, like, we're just going to ignore the four rooms. Okay, we're just going to go straight to this room. And, uh, and I just told them, like, this is the best that I can do. It's the best that I can do, but you're welcome to come in, you know. And uh, I tell them, if you're going to judge me, then do the dishes. <laughs> okay, because I don't have the time. <laughs> and I'm joking, but with some truth, you know. But, um, and I invite them in. And I can tell you at different points, I, I, I remember at one point in my sobriety, I, uh, 
I had about like seven girls I was sponsoring, and they were all so tight knit, and we had we had the greatest times together. They came over to my house. I had a house at the time, like you know, just a couple months ago. I had this like room that I was renting because I decided to recreate my life. So that meant living in a room. <laughs> you know, to go back to school, you know, but I had, I was renting a house and I would have them come over and I had a puzzle always on the table for us to do together and just to talk, you know, and it was like a safe environment. You just come over, you hang. Um, I had my, I was able to open my house open on holidays, on Thanksgiving. If you didn't have a place to go, come on over, just please call so I can have a plate for you. That's what I would ask. You know, I opened my house open on Christmas Eve to alcoholics who are struggling. You know, you're more than welcome to come over. You know, I tell people, um, you know, like, here's my phone number. You can call me anytime. And I mean that. And I tell them, like, if you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, if I pick up, you don't need to apologize. That's it. You know? I mean, I always tell people to call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, not 6 a.m. in the morning. I am not the 6 a.m. in the morning call. I am, like, the 2 a.m. in the morning call. Like, I will be up. And uh, But by doing those things and inviting people into my life when I can, like, I was in a position where I could do that. You know, that I was able to help other people develop a, you know, get a firm foundation in this program. Those women, um, they moved on to other sponsors, and they're having beautiful lives. And it's amazing to watch them recreate their lives and get married and have kids and see them just develop this beautiful life and then sponsor other people and then offer the same thing, you know. And it just shows me how this program just works, you know, by just, like, thinking less of myself. And I've learned that the definition of humility is, like, not thinking of myself, is thinking of myself less, not thinking less of myself. You know, and that was a big thing for me. Um, it goes on to say, let's see. But life among Alcoholics Anonymous is more than attending gatherings and visiting hospital, cleaning up old scrapes, helping to settle family differences, explaining the disinherited son to this, his eerie parents, lending money and securing jobs for each other. When justified, these are everyday occurrences. No one is too discredited or has sunk too low to be welcomed cordially if he means business. And that's true. Like, I'll go to hell and back for anybody who's willing. And I tell all my sponsees that. You know what I mean? You do the work, I'll be with you. And we'll walk through this, and we'll invite God along the way. If I'm not standing with you, and you're in hell, you might want to look about where, what you've said you've been, what you've been doing. You know, and my sponsor has done that for me, and I do that for my sponsees. Um, and it goes on the same page, 162 is a big book. Someday we hope that every alcoholic who journeys will find a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at his destination. I've been uh, all over the United, all over the United States because I had a. Uh, I joined a company where I was traveling for three months, and I was doing uh, expo com- conventions, and I didn't know how crazy that job was. I seemed to always keep picking crazy and crazy jobs, right? And with really long hours, always. And uh, I found myself in San Francisco, which Bill just came from, and uh, I, uh, my, my anonymity got broken to my boss. And because my other friend told her that I was an alcoholic synonymous, and she did, did not have the greatest view of AA. And it was like such a horrible feeling, and I did not have a car. And I, like, you got paid bi weekly or sometimes monthly, so I had like bare, I had $20 for the week. And I was like, ah! And you know what's so amazing? I called up AA. I went to this meeting, and it was like a crazy meeting. It was so funny. There's like a microphone, and they're like interviewing. They interview the speakers at this one. They're like, so tell me how you found God, and they, and they take it away. I'm like, where did I go? And I'm like, okay. And they're like, who are you? I'm like, no one. Like, I'm like, Casey, I'm from out of town. And these people, these young people in AA picked me up, and they made sure um, I got home to my hotel room every night. They picked me up every day after work. And they took me to a meeting and that I spent every day after work with them. I started work at like 7 in the morning. I got done at 7 p.m. And they would meet me at 7.30 and we'd go to the diner and then to a meeting. And uh, it, was, it was such a great feeling. There was some guy who was doing his fifth step. He was procrastinating on his fourth step. I'm like, you need to do it. I'm going to put you in the lobby of the hotel and lock you in there. You need to do this. And we just had this like really great time. You know, that it was like newcomers were helping me just get around and like helping me sure I had a meeting and it was an amazing thing and it just helped me to see how like 
you know, A does exist. And it's such a great feeling to know wherever I go in this world, you know, that I can find someone who's like, who, who knows what I feel like, you know. And there's people who would send their hand to me and they felt, and I was, and I felt so isolated. You know, I, I never had that feeling before, having my anonymity broken, but away from like my home territory. You know, it was like such a weird feeling. And, uh, and it was okay. It was all meant in good motive. I knew by my friend. And it was an amazing experience because I really saw how God still takes care of me, even when if I'm in San Francisco. And when I can't reach my sponsor and when my network's not there, that strangers will help me. You know, and that's the beauty of AA. Because I can tell you, no matter what part of my life, um, I've come to AA, you know. And I've come to AA. I had like 10 years sober, and I had a relationship that ended and then my whole life just fell apart. And I, like, you know, I had this whole idea that we were going to get married and everything. And, like, it was nothing like that. And I found myself, like, on 4th of July, and I was supposed to be away, and I wasn't. And I was so mad. You know, and I saw this kid. She was, like, in leopard tights and a turquoise skirt, skirt with, like, combat boots and a black sweater and purple hair. I'm like, oh, my God, she's screaming for attention. I hate her already. You know, I went nothing. And I was speaking this night, and I was like, I did not want to speak, and I was so upset. And uh, I've been on, like, an autopilot. And I, and I was so upset that this was happening to me in my life, you know, that I'm forced again to recreate my life. I didn't ask this time to recreate my life, God. You know, why are you making me do this? Why can't it go the way I want? And it was such a great feeling because I, um, I fell apart in this meeting and I just cried because, you know what, it was, like, so nice because everybody I knew was away that weekend. And I opted not to go away that weekend to spend it with this guy I was dating. And uh, we broke up and I just was that reminder, like, I am not away again because of him. And I was so angry. But what I felt was, like, how blessed and lucky I am because I didn't have a place to go. I didn't think I had a place to go. And then I forgot I have AA. And I went to this meeting. You know, and I cried. I spoke the one the first speaker spoke for like 45 minutes saved me too. I cried for one and the other one I had no idea what I said and um And I felt completely at home and there's people in this meeting that I knew I got like That fire in me about like I didn't know what to do with my life You know what and God was so blessed it was so so great because he gave me two sponsees that night the girl in the leopard tights and the turquoise skirt <laughs> she's like will you be my sponsor I'm like you really want what I have I cried the whole meeting I was like okay you know and I got and she was a six year old kid who was just trying to find her way and I knew what that felt like and I was able to help her find a footing in AA I had another woman I started sponsoring and God just you know I didn't know what to do at that moment and then I forgot it's like the same thing what I always do I you know I go to a meeting I show up, I do the next right thing, what's in front of me to do. And that's has always been how I found the answers to my problems. Like, I just do the next right thing in front of me to do. And I'm going to end with just reading the end of 164. Still, you may say, but I will, but I will not have the benefit of contact with, with you who wrote this book. We cannot be sure. God will determine that. So you must remember that you, your real reliance is upon him. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we will know only a, only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is a great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand him, understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and you will surely meet some of us and you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.